The second stage of the US crypto crackdown could be about to begin. That's because the Federal Reserve recently put out a warning to banks working with crypto projects and companies, particularly stablecoins. Now, the last time this happened was back in January, and in the months that followed, half a dozen crypto projects, companies, and banks were targeted by regulators, and a major stablecoin lost its peg. So today, we're going to give you a bit of background about the ongoing crypto crackdown, summarize the Fed's recent warnings to crypto-friendly banks, and tell you what it could all mean for the crypto market. Let's start with a bit of background. If you watched our first video about the US's crypto crackdown, you'll know it's believed to have begun in January this year, when the Fed and other banking regulators put out a warning to financial institutions working with crypto. In the months that followed, crypto exchanges such as Binance started losing access to banking services, regulators started targeting stablecoin issuers such as Paxos, and ratings agencies started downgrading crypto-friendly banks such as Silvergate, which went down under questionable circumstances. And during the banking crisis in March, regulators shut down Signature, another crypto-friendly bank, again under questionable circumstances. Meanwhile, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank caused Circle's USDC stablecoin to depeg, which caused chaos in the crypto markets, especially DeFi. Now, if you watched our subsequent video about the man behind the crypto crackdown, you'll know that Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr is the big bad wolf of this tale. In that video, we showed how he used the crypto-friendly bank failures as proof that crypto, especially stablecoins, needs more regulation. You'll also know that Michael had made it clear that the Fed and its allies would continue to use regulation by enforcement to address stablecoins until Congress passes actual regulations. And Michael even created a new crypto team to address these, quote, unregulated stablecoins. At the same time, the Fed announced that it would be launching its FedNow fast payment system in July. If you watched our video about FedNow, you'll know that it's a precursor to a central bank digital currency, or CBDC. You'll also know we've speculated about stablecoins being competitors to FedNow. Circumstantial evidence for this was revealed in June when Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said that the central bank sees stablecoins as a form of money. Now, in theory, this was bullish, but in practice, it was the opposite. That's because it's the central bank's job to manage money, not a stablecoin issuer's. Stronger circumstantial evidence of stablecoins being competitors to FedNow emerged in July when it was revealed that authorities had raided Deltec Bank in the Bahamas. Now, for context, Deltec is one of the banks believed to be used by USDT issuer Tether. Tens of millions of dollars were reportedly seized. Note, though, that it's not known whether these accounts were related to Tether or any other crypto entities. To put things into perspective, this raid on Deltec took place just two days before the launch of FedNow. This could just be a coincidence, and it probably is. What's harder to explain, however, is the urgency with which pro-crypto politicians have been trying to push through stablecoin regulations. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Michael said that the Fed and its allies would continue to use regulation by enforcement until Congress passes crypto regulations. The urgency surrounding recent stablecoin regulations could therefore be a sign that more enforcement is coming down the pipe. This enforcement may not necessarily come from the Fed either. Some of you may have heard about a problematic provision in the US defense bill. The TLDR is that it could require stablecoin issuers to collect KYC from all stablecoin holders and users not just the entities who mint and redeem stablecoins. Put simply, if the US defense bill passes as it's currently written, you could be required to complete KYC to use any stablecoins you hold in your personal wallet. Obviously, this is not guaranteed to happen, but it's just one of many stablecoin-related regulatory concerns that have emerged over the last few months. All of these concerns pale in comparison to the latest addition to the pile, however, and that's the Fed's announcement that it will be increasing its oversight 
of crypto-friendly banks. This announcement came just 24 hours after PayPal had announced the launch of its own stablecoin. Probably just another coincidence. Speculation aside, the Fed's announcement specified that it was a de facto part two to a similar announcement it had made back in January. This January announcement consisted of two documents, a memo and a policy statement. In principle, the memo and policy statement were supposed to, quote, level the playing field for banks interacting with crypto companies and projects. In reality, leveling the playing field basically meant restricting smaller banks from having more access to crypto than bigger banks, namely state banks. The memo noted that state banks overseen by the Fed would face restrictions on crypto holdings and would also have to effectively seek approval from banking regulators before issuing US dollar stablecoins. It's not clear what the memo meant by issuing, but this presumably meant minting a stablecoin. This would explain why the FDIC alleged that Cross River Bank had engaged in, quote, unsafe lending practices shortly after it partnered with Circle for USDC minting and redeeming. On that note, the FDIC recently put out a report of its own warning of the, quote, novel and complex risks of crypto to banks. As for the policy statement, meanwhile, it noted that it would be modifying its interpretation of existing banking regulations so that they apply to crypto-related activities. Now, this sounds pretty boring, but is extremely significant because applying TradFi regulations to crypto runs the risk of turning crypto into TradFi, so to speak. Thankfully, the policy statement explains the relevant banking regulations in plain English. Quote, Under Section 913 of the Act, the Federal Reserve Board may limit the activities of a state member bank and its subsidiaries to those activities that are permissible for a national bank in a manner consistent with Section 24 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, FDIA. Section 24 of the FDIA generally prohibits insured state banks from engaging as principal in any activity that is not permissible for national banks unless authorized by federal statute or the FDIC. Again, this would explain the Cross River Bank warning. The policy statement continues by explaining how it would apply these banking regulations to certain crypto activities. It starts by saying that banks are technically allowed to custody crypto, although it is discouraged. However, they are not allowed to hold crypto as assets on their balance sheets. Regarding stablecoins, meanwhile, the policy statement reiterates that banks must effectively seek approval from banking regulators before issuing stablecoins. But, like the custody of crypto, the policy statement seems to discourage banks from even trying to do anything with stablecoins. Consider the following, quote, The board generally believes that issuing tokens on open, public and or decentralized networks or similar systems is highly likely to be inconsistent with safe and sound banking practices. Translation, sure, you can work with stablecoins, but it's not safe or sound, so it's better that you don't. Moreover, quote, the board believes such risks are pronounced where the issuing bank does not have the capability to obtain and verify the identity of all transacting parties, including for those using unhosted wallets. This pertains directly to the KYC provision in the Defense Act that we discussed earlier. But of course, that's probably just another coincidence. Anyways, this ties in to the Fed's recent announcement from earlier this month. Like the January announcement, the August announcement consisted of two documents. The difference is that one detailed the creation of a new supervision program, and the other is specific to stablecoins. The document detailing the creation of a new supervision program starts with a disclaimer. Quote, this letter applies to all banking organizations supervised by the Federal Reserve, including those with $10 billion or less in consolidated assets. In other words, it essentially applies to every bank in the United States. The authors explain that the purpose of the program is to enhance the supervision of, quote, novel activities, including crypto-related activities. The objective is to mitigate the risks associated with these activities 
hence why it takes a risk-based approach. The authors specify that they will focus on four novel activities. Non-banks that provide banking services, crypto-related activities, including stablecoins, any bank projects that use distributed ledger technology, and banks that provide a lot of services for crypto companies and projects, i.e. crypto-friendly banks. The authors highlight the fact that no new supervisory processes will be created for these four novel activities. Rather, they'll be supervised like all other activities, based on risk. Put differently, same risk, same regulation. The aforementioned principle that could turn crypto into another arm of TradFi. What's scary is that the authors note, quote, the Federal Reserve will notify in writing those supervised banking organizations whose novel activities will be subject to examination through the program. No US bank has received this notification at the time of shooting this video, at least not to our knowledge. For what it's worth, the authors also note that, quote, banking organizations are neither prohibited nor discouraged from providing banking services to customers of any specific class or type as permitted by law or regulation. As we've seen, though, the Fed clearly wants banks to stop working with crypto. Now, this relates to the second document, which details the reporting process that banks must go through if they want to engage in any stablecoin-related activities. It applies to all US banks, and it builds directly on the banking regulation from the January announcement, which we discussed earlier. Here, the Fed clarifies that stablecoin-related activities includes, quote, issuing, holding, or transacting in dollar tokens to facilitate payments. This wording is more important than you might think because there's a huge difference between payment stablecoin and non-payment stablecoin regulation, at least in the US. If you watched our video about the stablecoin hearing from earlier this year, you'll know that payment stablecoins are supposed to be regulated by the Fed, whereas non-payment stablecoins are supposed to be regulated by the SEC, like money market funds, at least according to the regulators. Some stablecoin issuers, notably Circle, have argued that their stablecoins are not securities because they're used primarily for payments. Now, logically, this protects them from an SEC crackdown, but simultaneously puts them in the Fed's sniper scope, which isn't all that better, in our opinion. Then again, Circle has been explicit about its intentions to be regulated by the Fed, and its CEO, Jeremy Allaire, tacitly admitted in an interview that the end game is to convert USDC into a CBDC. For now, though, Circle is trying to become regulated by the Fed without causing a crackdown in the process. Talk about walking a tightrope. Regardless, the key takeaway is that the Fed's oversight of stablecoin-related activities only relates to those considered to be payment stablecoins. In any case, the authors go on to note that any bank that wants to engage in stablecoin-related activities must notify its respective Fed branch first. If the Fed approves of the bank's stablecoin-related activities, they'll be given a special letter called a, quote, supervisory non-objection letter. Naturally, the bank will also have to prove to the Fed that it has addressed the operational, cybersecurity, liquidity, illicit finance, and consumer compliance risks associated with their stablecoin-related activities. What's odd is that the authors don't give much information about the consumer compliance risks. All they say is that the bank must ensure that it is upholding the, quote, regulations that apply to the specific dollar token activity. This seems to be a not-so-subtle reference to the KYC provision for stablecoins in the US Defense Bill. Recall that the Fed had asked for this in its January announcement. So, this begs the question of what happens to banks that are already engaging in stablecoin-related activities. Well, one of the footnotes has an answer. All US banks already engaging in stablecoin-related activities must notify the Fed within 30 days of its announcement, so by the 8th of September 2023. The footnote also notes that banks already engaging in stablecoin-related activities will be allowed to do so until the Fed is finished deciding whether to provide that special supervisory non-objection letter. 
It's not entirely clear if this decision period also ends on the 8th of September or has an indefinite timeline. The footnote also doesn't say what happens to banks already engaging in stablecoin-related activities that fail to receive Fed approval or fail to notify the Fed about these activities. Chances are they would be forced to stop engaging in all such activities and potentially face fines or worse. We couldn't help but notice that the final footnote references the warning issued by the Fed and other regulators to banks working with crypto back in early January. This was the warning that kicked off the first stage of the crypto crackdown, the same warning that said crypto activities are inherently unsafe. Castle Island Ventures partner Nick Carter believes that the August announcement codifies the pressure that's been applied to crypto-friendly banks since January. Nick calls this, quote, regulation by blog post, and he underscored the fact that this scrutiny is also being applied to entities in the non-banking sector. Nick also noticed the same thing that we did, and that's that the wording around the stablecoin-related risks that banks must address makes compliance impossible for stablecoins issued on public blockchains. As such, Nick believes this new guidance is a way of banning banks from working with crypto stablecoins. The good news is that non-bank entities will continue to have the ability to provide stablecoin-related services, and it's possible that PayPal is looking to capitalize on this with its new stablecoin. The bad news is that non-banks are also starting to face Fed scrutiny, which could cause other issues. All of which brings us on to the big question, and that's what the Fed's recent announcement means for the crypto market. Well, the short answer is that we'll find out around the 8th of September, after all banks have notified the Fed about their stablecoin-related activities, and the Fed starts deciding who lives and who dies. However, this September deadline could be extended. Besides the fact that the Fed could take additional time to decide whether to issue those special letters of approval or rejection, the KYC provision on stablecoins in the US defense bill could also extend the deadline by up to four months. That's because the defense bill specifies that the KYC provision on stablecoins could go into force as long as 120 days after it's passed. This ultimately depends on when the Treasury Department decides to implement this provision. Some would say that it would look to do so as soon as possible. On that note, it's possible that the Fed won't be able to do anything about banks already providing stablecoin services until the defense bill is passed. That's because the August announcement says consumer compliance risks must be addressed in line with existing laws about stablecoins. Until that defense bill is passed and the Treasury implements the KYC provision on stablecoins, the Fed won't be able to force banks to stop providing services for crypto-related stablecoins. Again, this assumes that the KYC provision for stablecoins will be included in the final version that becomes law. This is by no means guaranteed. It's more than likely that pro-crypto politicians in the House will try and remove it. For reference, the defense bill was recently passed by the Senate and is currently working its way through the House. Once approved, it'll be sent to the president and signed into law. And there are actually two very similar defense bills bouncing between the House and the Senate. But, well, let's not go down that rabbit hole today. Now, assuming the KYC provision on stablecoins is removed from the defense bill, it's more than likely that banks will continue to face scrutiny from the Fed for any crypto-related services they provide. It also won't protect non-payment stablecoins from the SEC, which is still actively trying to kill crypto. Assuming the KYC provision on stablecoins remains in the defense bill, then it's quite possible that US banks will not be allowed to provide any crypto stablecoin related services. How much this affects the crypto market fundamentally depends on how intertwined stablecoin issuers are with US banks. US based stablecoin issuers like Circle clearly have connections to US banks, which means they would be the most affected. Now, the silver lining here is that neither USDC nor USDP are really used much outside of DeFi. A disruption to their operations wouldn't have a direct effect on the crypto market per se. Not only that, 
but banks could continue to offer services for crypto stablecoins if their holders complete KYC. This is something that Circle has apparently been preparing for. It's been working on its own digital ID solution dubbed Verite. That said, whether crypto users would adopt a KYC stablecoin remains to be seen. By contrast, it's not clear how connected offshore stablecoin issuers like Tether are to US banks. It's also not clear if the indirect connections offshore stablecoin issuers have to US banks fall under the scope of the Fed's new requirements. Note, they must have indirect connections due to their USD reserves. If offshore stablecoins manage to outmaneuver the Fed's new requirements and the defense bill's KYC provisions, then it would likely result in even more adoption of said stablecoins. The catch is that their continued growth would make them even bigger targets for US regulators. If the recent crackdown on Deltek Bank is any indication, offshore stablecoins aren't off limits to the US government. If US authorities want them gone, they will find some way to do it. If their attitude towards domestic stablecoins is anything to go by, offshore stablecoins are a target too. Some would say the goal is for every crypto to trade against a KYC stablecoin controlled by the Fed. Whatever the case, it's safe to say that the next month is going to be a fascinating time for stablecoins of all kinds. That's why it's important to understand what role each stablecoin plays in the crypto market and how changes in their market caps could affect crypto prices. We happen to have a video about exactly that, and the link is down in the description. And folks, that is all for today's video. If you found it informative, let me know by smashing that like button. If you want to stay informed, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you want to help others stay informed, be sure to share this video with them, if you think they ought to see it, of course. And if you're the kind of crypto cat who stacks sats instead of stablecoins, make sure you're accumulating them using a cost-effective exchange and storing them on the most secure crypto wallet you can. As it so happens, the Coin Bureau Deals page can help with both. It's got up to $40,000 in discounts, airdrops, and incentives on the best crypto exchanges, and the biggest discounts on the best hardware wallets. The link will be down in the description. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. So until then, stay cool, stay out of trouble, and stay crypto.